The resource sector is off to a great start, so what could slow it down? You're listening to Kiko Roundtable. I'm your host, Michael McRae. Kiko correspondent Paul Harris is here. How are you doing, Paul? Very well, Michael. Thank you very much. How are you? And with us is Paul Harbage. He is former CEO of G2 Gold that was acquired by Newmont for $456 million. Paul is back with Faraday Copper. Paul, welcome. Thank you, Michael. Hi, Paul. Paul, what's Faraday focused on? So we're focused on the Copper Creek project, which is one of the largest undeveloped uh, copper resources in North America. It's located in Arizona, the, um, the tier one jurisdiction within the USA. Let's turn to macro. Gold hit a nine month high on Friday with precious metal in the 1920 range. Kiko columnist Jim Wyckoff said that the yellow metal bulls are at least quietly starting to discuss a new record high. Gold would need another $100 to get there. Copper is looking great, it hitting its highest price since June this week. It is currently trading at the 420 a pound level. Oil has also been creeping up with a commodity breaking into the 80s range. The key economic driver going forward will be a China opening and the debt standoff in Congress. China's decision to reopen its economy will increase inflation in Europe as they both compete for more energy. The president of the European Central Bank, Christine Lagarde, said Friday. She also added that central banks on both sides of the Atlantic will stay the course on interest rates to cool down their economies and tame high inflation. Other news, the U.S. government hit its $31.4 trillion borrowing limit on Thursday amid a standoff between the Republican-controlled House of Representatives and President Joe Biden's Democrats on lifting the ceiling, which could lead to a fiscal crisis in a few months, writes Reuters. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen informed congressional leaders, including the House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, that her department had begun to use extraordinary cash measurements to stave off default until the spring. Paul, what were the mining headlines? I assume you're talking about me there, Michael. Uh, a lot of country <laughs> risk factors on show this week. In Chile, Andes Iron lost its battle to develop the Dominga Iron Ore Copper Project and port facility near La Higuera in the Coquimbo region. The Committee of Ministers accepted appeals presented by environmental organizations against the project's EIA and struck down the project. Environmentalists were concerned about the impacts of developing a port facility in close proximity to the Humboldt Penguin National Marine Reserve, which is home to Humboldt Penguin Quarterly, dolphins, whales, and other marine life. And design a private Chilean company plan to build an open pit mining operation with an anticipated lifespan of 27 years to produce 12 million tonnes per year of iron concentrate and 150,000 tonnes per annum of copper concentrate, 2.5 billion US dollar development cost there. Miners in Peru are closing their minds as a precaution as a wave of violent protests continues to sweep the country against protesting against the removal of former President Pedro Castillo in December 22. Copper producers Glencore, MMG, and Hud Bay Minerals are all impacted, as is tin producer Min Sur. Last weekend, a state of emergency was declared in the capital Lima, and regional capitals Cusco, Puno, and also the port of Cayao near Lima, suspending certain constitutional rights. That didn't stop a massive number of people converging on Lima yesterday, where there were large-scale violent protests. At least 50 people have been killed in the protests so far. Protesters are demanding the reinstatement of Castillo and elections. In Colombia, Colombia's president, Gustavo Petro, has said his government will block mining projects that threaten water sources, indicating it will not allow Anglo Gold Ashanti's Capadona Copper Gold project to advance. The president there is citing the precautionary principle. Another blow to the mining sector in Antioquia, where Capadona project is located was dealt when the National Mining Agency, the AMN, issued a resolution which withdrew the delegated authority for Antioquia to administer projects of national interest. So Kebridoni is one of those, Gramalotti is another. These will now be exclusively administered from the capital, Bogota. Paul uh, Harbage, um, I'd like to bring you back, uh, despite uh, Paul Harris's uh, kind of a gloomy roundup there on uh, the mining headlines. Um, it's just been a tremendous uh, start to the year, and I think it's kind of an unanticipated or how would you say a kind of a delightful uptick uh, to the start of the year just with these strong commodity prices. What's the outlook do you see for juniors? 
No, I mean, it's great. I mean, when you think when we last met in Zurich uh, uh, towards the end of last year, you know, it was all doom and gloom. It was difficult for people, you know, to take meetings. Uh, there was really no interest in the sector. But within the space of a few weeks, you know, we started to see more positive data coming out from particularly the, the U.S. And that seemed to be the catalyst that, um, you know, things started to improve. I think there's still these two camps, though. There's the camps that still fear that recession, that this uptick is potentially short-lived and we're going to see some uh, profit-taking. And then there's the other side where people feel, you know, we're through the worst of it. We probably um, um, topped out on, on interest rate hikes and we might see it coming down and, and there's going to be a soft landing. And so that's added some fuel to you know, to commodities, you know, with China opening, starting to open up as well, then there's that been in that improvement. But even even so, you know, I think we were starting to feel we bottomed out, you know, share prices had come down significantly from, you know, May last year, and you seem to be bouncing along the bottom. So yeah, it's been a great start to the year. And, and let's hope that that momentum will continue. Uh, Paul Harris. And I think there's other short-term factors in there as well. You know, I mentioned some of the uh, the protests in Peru shutting uh, or closing some of the mines temporarily. Uh, the three mines I mentioned, the three copper mines I mentioned, that's 2%. They're responsible for 2% of the world's copper supply. So there does seem to be there's going to be these short-term things as well, which will continue to benefit the copper price but impact the copper market. Uh, Paul Harbage, uh, let's talk about uh, copper. Bring us up to date. What's the case? I mean, half joking, but, you know, if I had a crystal ball, we probably all wouldn't be here. But, you know, ultimately, when you think of the bigger picture, you know, the society that we live in is is fundamentally changing. You know, since the Industrial Revolution, we've lived on the uh, on hydrocarbons. And now with this whole clean energy transition, um, you know, move to electric cars, uh, sustainable energy sources, then copper is going to play a key role in that going forward. And, and therefore, you know, we've all seen the, the supply demand curve saying that we need more copper. And so that's going to really support the copper price. I don't think necessarily, though, the demand's going to be um, a, such a sharp increase as some of the projections are, but I think it will be a more of a, a gradual increase. But certainly that's going to be great for copper. And, and the fact that, you know, as, as Paul mentioned, you know, with this, uh, you know, instability in Latin America, which is one of the largest copper producing areas in the world, then, um, you know, the, the need for more projects um, is is there. And I want to add on to that. I mean, I think you can start perhaps to draw some parallels with the last copper cycle, you know, the so-called super cycle. Back then, there were very low copper interest uh, inventories in the warehouses. We've got that same situation today. So sort of 10, 15 years ago, anything that uh, disrupted production in a major mine would spike the copper price because it would have a very direct impact on, on world copper supply. Uh, Paul Harbage, uh, we did note uh, the uh, difficulties uh, that uh, Latin America had this week in terms of advancing projects. Um, how is the um, environment in the U.S.? Uh, can you build a mine in America? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, this is the, the big contradiction, isn't it, around, around the world that you know, everybody everybody wants this clean energy transition. They all want the electric cars. But you mentioned the word mining and there's this no way we don't want any mining. Um, and and so I think also from the perspective of the uh, the mining sector, you know, we need to educate the population about mining. And but we are seeing the winds of change in the U.S. particularly. You know, and I think with the war in Ukraine, the, the global supply issues, there's a recognition that the U.S. needs homegrown production. And so you're certainly seeing U-turns in the um, Biden administration with them looking to want to facilitate uh, permitting. Um, you know, there's also funding now into mining projects uh, from the government as well as from the military. And and just ourselves in Faraday, we've noted that the um, the BLM are starting to staff up, um, providing the resources to support the mining industry, particularly in uh, places like Arizona. So, you know, we've got a very bullish view on uh, being able to develop a mine in the U.S. Paul Harris. 
Paul, I'd like to sort of dig into that a little bit more, if I may. Um, last week, we saw INA get a $700 million sort of credit facility or loan agreement with the Department of Energy. As you say, the US government is starting to make funds available for critical metals projects. Um, zinc has been declared a critical metal, but copper still hasn't. Um, why do you think that is? Is there something political there? I don't think it's political. I think, again, it just takes time and, and education, you know, that, um, I mean, Arizona produces 70% of the copper within the US. So I don't think they've got, a, you know, an immediate short term uh, demand for, for copper. But again, it's this, you know, the problem with these governments is they only have this four, uh, four year view, you know, and worrying about re-election. And really, it's thinking about, you know, a, a 10 to 20 year vision that they need to have. But certainly copper is going to play an important role going forward. I mean, going going back to permitting, though, then, um, you know, I think there's obviously still challenges anywhere in the world. I mean, Paul, you mentioned about, you know, down in Latin America, whether it's with um, with the effects on nature. So, uh, you know, certainly, um, potentially not all projects will get permitted. But, you know, at Faraday, you know, we're in a, a great location in terms of, you know, we've got no... Um, urbanization close by you know we've got no um sort of native indian reserves or or national forests etc so i think it's a you know you gauge your project on its own merits paul harbage uh, we've seen uh the impact uh for uh the inflation reduction act uh, but it seems to have been a little bit more downstream i kind of think of piedmont lithium uh, i think of uh, what is happening at Sherbrooke global uh that are kind of developing uh, downstream operations has there been any impact upon a company like yourself for instance for the juniors either in terms of is there possible funds there or is it uh, actually is it going to be uh, better uh, more resources say put into permitting well, we've certainly seen in our case, you know, more more resources going into permitting, cutting down the timeframes to getting drill permits, and starting to to facilitate the the support needed to take um, a project through the permitting process. Um, mm. And and it's great that we're starting to see funding coming into the sector. Sorry, is that uh, is that state, or would you say that's uh, across across the US? Um, well, in Arizona, we're certainly seeing support from the state, but also from the federal government as well in terms of, um, you know, providing the support to, you know, particularly permitting. Hmm. Now, and, and there's, I'm sorry, the, the final point is, you know, we see it starting to see a, a lot more lobbying um, in Washington as well at the federal level. Now, uh, Paul Harbage, uh, you've done this uh, before with uh, GD Cold. Uh, lessons learned on uh, doing it again. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, how do we differentiate ourselves in the junior world, you know, and it's about, you know, firstly, making sure that you're you're working on the right asset, that it's got the ability to, to become a mine. And then, you know, if you're looking for someone to acquire you to say, build the project, then it's making sure that you're doing the work that an acquirer wants. So de-risking the project technically, making sure that, you know, you've got the geological work done, you've drilled it to the right spacing, you've done the geotechnical studies, the metallurgy, essentially, you know, you're ticking their due diligence box and doing it to the standard that they want it to be at. Uh, rather than using assumptions. Now, um, you know, uh, GT Gold is in your past. Uh, and that was a project up in uh, Northwest British Columbia in the Golden Triangle, which has kind of been going uh, from strength to strength. Uh, you look at uh, what uh, Newcrest has bought up there, and never mind uh, Newmont uh, making the investment into your own GT Gold. I, I know that it's kind of outside of your kin right now, but um, and you are focused on Faraday, but uh, just kind of looking at uh, the Golden Triangle as a whole, what has been consequential up there or what do you anticipate will be kind of the next big move that will be happening up in the Golden Triangle as a whole? I mean, you know, in terms, there's, there's a couple of key things that have, uh, that have helped, um, you know, the Golden Triangle. I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a, a great place endowed with, um, you know, great geology and therefore depo deposits. But it's been a working relationship with the BC government as well as the First Nations that's really been promoting BC as a place to come and mine. 
and, and providing that framework and support that if you make a discovery, you can take it through to um, production. I mean, I think probably one of the next mines to come on stream there is, is Skeena, you know, at uh, SK Creek. Um, you know, they're well on the way with permitting and got great support from the toll town as well as the BC government. Uh, now, Paul Harbich, uh, before we turn to the number of the week, um, you had the deal that you did with GT Gold. You had some time that you were considering another number of projects. And so uh, maybe talk about, um, I, I think you chose it well, uh, you know, choosing a focus on uh, North America. But um, I was just kind of wondering why you decided to stay there. Uh, was there some type of risk or reward that you were looking at, say, exploring something that might have been further afield? Yeah, first, Michael, it's simple. It's First and foremost, it, it's the asset. It's about the quality of the geology. You know, that comes first. And then I look at jurisdiction and risk. And, uh, you know, we were fortunate that in Faraday, the asset, Copper Creek, was really essentially forgotten about, you know, hadn't been worked on for 10 years. And, I, you know, with my experience of fortunately being involved in making world-class discoveries, being able to look at the data sets and, and recognise the opportunity, and the fact that it's within a tier one jurisdiction, all the better. And, you know, just a, a two hour flight from Vancouver, you know, you're not having to fly around the world and, and suffer time zones and be disconnected from the, the team in the field. Let's turn to our number of the week. Uh, Paul Harbage, guest always goes first. What's your number? My number is 180. And that is the number of pounds of copper in electric vehicle. Paul Harris. What's your number? The one you forgot at the top, Michael, four twenty, four dollars twenty per pound. Copper's at its highest level since the copper price is its highest level for six months since about June last year. My number is twenty five. Uh, look, uh, copper's doing well, but uh, I mean, uh, we're seeing the uh, operational results uh, that are just kind of starting to come out uh, for the year end, and uh, just the monster move in lithium uh, is uh, just been something to behold. Uh, my number is twenty five, and that's twenty five times. Uh, that is Pilbara Minerals cash balance is up twenty five times since twenty twenty when it was sitting on just eighty six million. At the start of the decade, it now has a cash kitty of $2.2 billion to play with. That's it for us. Paul Harbage, news out of Faraday Copper over the next 12 months. Yeah, um, let's drill results. We're in the middle of a 10,000 meter drill program. So we put some results out earlier in the week. So expect more to come. And then the big one is the PEA on the Copper Creek project, which is due out in early quarter two. Follow me at Michael McRae. That's McRae with two C's. Paul is at Paul Harris Gold. Paul Harbage, how would you like people to get a hold of you? Yeah, just go through our website on FaradayCopper.com. If you like what you hear, tell a friend. Don't forget to subscribe. On behalf of Paul Harris, Paul Harbage, and myself, have a pleasant week.